We can review it, yeah, but you're not going to... In 30 years, well, this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about two minutes until six. We'll start promptly at six, but we have about two minutes, so you can start finding your seat shortly. Right, ladies and gentlemen, if you could grab your seats, we are going to get started at six o'clock. So we wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for coming. And so with that, to kick it off, the Board of Education President, Anthony Gomez. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, as Black Tigers, we roar and we roar loudest when we're together. So it's so important to see so many faces here in the crowd 
and people watching at home that take an interest in what we're doing and care about it. So thank you for that. First and foremost, I wanna to introduce to our community our interim superintendent, Mr. Rusty Shabity, who is a 1974 graduate. I want to take a moment to just talk about some of the different stakeholder groups I see here tonight to talk about what makes up our community in Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, first and foremost, we have our planning committee members. The planning committee is a group of people that have committed to meet with the Board of Education once a month to do deep dives on this project and this process and to give us very honest feedback on where we're going. And we couldn't be where we are today without them. So, Planning Committee members, thank you so much for being here. We have many staff members, and I also know our CFEA president, Melody Carlisle, was hoping to come tonight or watch from home. I want to acknowledge her and thank her for being here and being part of this because we are building their future workspaces as well. I want to thank city and village leaders. Both of our mayors have been very supportive and very involved in this process. Our mayors are here tonight, and we also have various city and village council members that have been invested. Thank you to them. And then community members themselves that just have an interest in this project, that are paying for this project as the taxpayers of our community. Thank you so much for being interested and involved. And last but not least, to then design architecture and him and construction, who are our design architecture firms and our construction firms. They have been phenomenal partners throughout this process and we're so grateful to them. Transparency has always been one of the key initiatives of any Board of Education I've known of in this district. And so that's why we're here tonight, to give you an honest update of where we're at at this very moment, because this project is changing and where we thought we might have been two months ago or two weeks ago might not be where we ended up with the presentation tonight. And co-equal is our desire to listen to you and hear your feedback. So you should have gotten a three by five note card and a pen when you came in. If you did not get one and would like one, raise your hand and we'll make sure one gets to you. You can put questions, comments, concerns you may have on those note cards throughout the night. And at various points, people are gonna walk around and pick those up. We're gonna address as many of those as we can tonight, knowing we might not get to them all before 7 p.m. There'll be an online portal where we're going to allow you to access that information as well. People that are watching via YouTube, there's an email in the description of the YouTube video that you can send your questions, comments, and concerns to as well. So the first half of tonight is we're asking you to listen to us about the project, and then the last half is listening to you about your questions and concerns. This is not our first community meeting. We've had two or three since bond passage, and it won't be our last. We'll have continued community meetings as well. Um, I had an opportunity to view some of these slides yesterday, and for those that know me, I teared up because it's just really awe-inspiring to see what education could be for our community. So sit back, relax, grab your tissues if you're like me and emotional, and prepare to hear, to hear another Cuyahoga Falls High School graduate, Chris Smith from Ben Architecture, a 1988 graduate of this high school. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, this is exciting. This is kind of an up, a progress update on where we are at the design, which is uh, only half of the excitement because the construction is the other half. Um, today, we're going to show you a, a, an overview of the project schedule and exactly where we are tonight. The second is going to be the pro a progress update. So we're going to take you through that and, and how we're going to proceed from here on out. Then we're going to show you some design highlights. Um, we're gonna show you a complete full design of the building after our next phase of design. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but we're gonna give you what we call some little sneak peeks and design highlights of, of what we've got designed so far. Uh, and then at the end, um, we're gonna answer questions that you put on those cards. So 
as you go, as we go and questions pop up, put them on those cards and we're gonna answer as many as we can within our time. And anything that we can't answer, we're gonna post the answers to on the website. But we will post all the questions and all the answers on the website so everybody can uh, have time to digest that. So the project schedule. This goes back a ways, right? I mean, we started master planning for this project back in 2015. Um, as you know, the bond passed in 2019. But as, as we look at this, right now, we're about halfway through the design process. So, and I'll get to the phases in a second, but what's most important about this slide is that because your partner in this is the state of Ohio, you hear us talk about the OFCC, it's the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, they're actually co-funding the project. They're giving you $36 million to help you finish this project out. So with that, the prices, the budget for the school was set in April of 2019. So the budget was set in April of 2019. The vote happened in November of 2019. It passed. And then something happened at the beginning of 2020. Uh, yeah, COVID, right? So the, it, the bad thing is that that st the state shut down for a year. So this period right here, we lost an entire year of design and construction due to COVID. So it wasn't until the spring of 2020 that we were even brought on board as the architect. Um, because the, and the state still didn't go give quite the go-ahead. They said, okay, you can go ahead and select your architect, but we can't put them under contract till, till fall of, of uh, 2021. But we're still not under contract yet. It's still paperwork and stuff like that, it's the state of Ohio. Um, but uh, the point being, the design that we've done so far was set on a budget pre-COVID, 2019. So with this, um, we're talking about construction happening here and opening the fall of 25, 26. Now, I talked a little bit about the phases of design. The first two phases are, are done. The first phase is the program of requirements. That's where we go through and figure out what kind of spaces are gonna be in your new school, uh, how big are those spaces, uh, how many of them, that kind of stuff. It's almost like a recipe to bake a cake. The second phase is schematic design, and that's the, the phase that we've just finished. So we actually finished it in August, this past August. After we finished that phase, it's the first time our construction manager partners have a time to take a look at that building and a full set of documents, conceptual, but a set of documents, a set of drawings, so they can apply an estimate to it. At that time, we do the exact same thing. We stop drawing. We send that out to another independent estimator, um, a completely different company to get an unbiased opinion on what that's gonna cost. Those two estimators come together and they tell us what, what the estimate is. Two things came out of that. The first thing was good news. They agreed on how much the project should cost. The bad news is we were 20 to 25% over budget. 100% due to um, supply chain issues, uh, labor shortages, all the stuff that you hear in everyday life. It's gas prices, it's everything. It affects the price of construction. But we're also looking for estimates on what something's gonna cost a year from now to build for the next two years. So the prices that we're getting, that our estimators are getting, that I'm sure the construction manager is getting, are everything down from the supplier to the installer, to the contractor, and there's all these layers where everybody's scared to death. Um, our suppliers don't know if they can get lockers two years from now. Um, so the prices came in really, really high. We've currently got another very large project in Perry, um, Ohio, uh, and the same thing. They're 20, 25% over budget, uh, and they're in a little worse shape than Calgo Falls, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the next phase we go into is called design development. Design development is where we first apply engineering to the building. So now we've got the building set, we've got the conceptual design set, but now we're actually engineering it. At the end of that phase, another set of estimates will be done by two different independent folks. Um, we'll get that back, and, and when that's on budget, we proceed to the blueprints to go ahead and bid the project. So that's our schedule. And then of course it'll be bid out, and then construction will happen. So I wanna give you an orientation because I wanna make a, a point on this next slide. This is the existing site. So if you can see Portage Trail runs right here. 13th is run along the bottom of your screen. Server Lake Avenue's over here, and Norma's to the north. So here's Bullock, here's Laybourne Field, and here's Newberry School. So when I click on the next slide, it's gonna be the, site, the new site plan. So what this is, Portage Trail's over here, 13th is here, Silver Lake is over here, and Norma's to the north. 
Everything you see in this brown color represents 365,000 square feet of new school. That's, the, that's what we call the co-funded portion. That's the part where the state of Ohio is partnering with you to build. That brown section includes everything from classrooms to cafeteria space to art rooms to music rooms um, to gymnasiums, everything that comes in that co-funded school. Now, the Board of Education and the Planning Committee and everybody that was involved in the pre-planning had two large what we call locally funded initiatives, which means they're outside the purview of the state. The state doesn't co-fund those, those items, but they thought it's important because these spaces are, and I agree, co-curricular. They're not extracurricular. And that is the auditorium, which is in this beige color right here. And then it's the stadium, which is right here. So the state of Ohio doesn't fund stadiums and they don't fund auditoriums. So with that, th those two together represent 15, 16 million dollars worth of, worth of work uh, that we want to do. So I mentioned that we're 20, 25 percent over budget right now. There are three pathways that we get to budget. And let me make this very important. I mentioned the co-funded portion of the building, that 365,000 square feet. And I mentioned the other LFIs, right? The most important thing, and this is for any project that you partner with the state in, is that you protect the co-funded project, the, the school building. That project has to be on budget or else you lose the $36 million that the state's going to give you. So the way you protect that is your locally funded initiatives. So because you've got $15, $16 million in locally funded initiatives, that is providing the cushion by which you're able to move forward. And thankfully you are. I mentioned the other school district, Perry and State Stark County, our project was four elementary schools. The voters voted for four elementary schools. They passed it for four elementary schools. And their board is meeting right now trying to decide we can only afford to do two. Do we do two? Or do we just scrap it and build a middle school? I mean, they're rethinking their entire plan and we're halfway, we're all the way through the next phase of design on that. So you're in a very, a much, much better position. So there's three strategies and I mentioned one already. Um, the bid strategies. Uh, and I'll give you another real example of this. So as you know, we're gonna demolish Newberry School, right? We already released the work, and this is Hammond Construction's idea, it's a brilliant idea. Uh, they separated the bidding into two different portions. One was to abate the asbestos, take out all the hazardous material, and then bid separately the demolition. So, and actually I, I believe the asbestos abatement's gonna be complete on Monday. So that work's been happening. It's been happening inside the building this whole time. Uh, that work's going to be totally done by Monday. But we're going to hold off on demolishing the building because a bid strategy to save the district money is let's wait till we have contractors on site doing the site work for everything else. That way we don't have, we don't have to import fill once we demolish this building and take all the, the building away. So it's going to save the district money. And that's just one example of a bid strategy. Another is we are going to fully design, you know, the locally funded initiatives, the, the auditorium, and the stadium, right? We are gonna fully design both of those spaces as if we didn't have a problem and we're gonna bid those out separately. So we're gonna go get real prices at the time of bidding, which is about a year from now, and hopefully some of these supply chain issues will have subsided by then, we're hopeful. But at least we're gonna get real prices rather than basing, hey, can we build this or can we not on an estimate of something we're gonna build a year from now for the next two years. So that's good that you have that to protect the budget because now the estate can stand by and say, okay, they've got a pathway to get to budget on their co-funded school. We're going to approve this to go into the next phase of design. The second is to pursue additional income sources. So you hear federal government, state government, there's, there's always new ways to, to free up funding. And I'll, I'll give you a, a quick example of what one of these may be. We're not, we're not sure if this makes sense or not. We're, we're exploring this right now. So instead of bidding out and buying all the furniture for the new building, we might decide to do a lease purchase. If you do a lease purchase for that furniture, the money that you were gonna to spend to buy it can go back into the project. And that's a way to help your budget and to be able to build more stuff now. And you can do that on quite a few things, uh, but, there, but the district is actively pursuing um, additional income sources to help, our, to help this budget problem. The second thing is the bid strategies. That would, so that's what we just talked about. And the third is to continue to refine the design. I showed an example of that site plan and what that looked like. And Scott's gonna talk here in a second about, uh, give you some ideas of what that looks like, but I'll give you just a really big idea. So when we finished schematic design four months ago, we've spent the last four months 
taking out as much as we can out of the budget. Now, I want to be very clear. That's, that's not, that doesn't mean we're cheapening up the building. Okay, so one strategy was we, we were stretching all the way from Portage Trail all the way to Newberry Hill with this new building. That's a lot of site work. That's a lot of foundation, a lot of roof, and that was a two-story academic scheme. We've redesigned that since then, and we've come up with this three-story academic scheme, um, which condenses the building a little bit. Less foundation, less roofs, uh, less walls. It's, it's, it's actually a more economic way of doing it, and quite honestly, it's a better solution because now the kids don't have to travel as far from one side of the building to the other, or um, they don't have to, uh, uh, there's opportunities with that vertical thing that I think you're gonna see in, uh, here in a second. So we're gonna pursue all three of these through the next phase, then we're gonna do an estimate, then we're gonna go through the next phase, then we're gonna do an estimate, but we are designing everything. So we're designing the auditorium, we're designing the stadium, we're designing everything. So when we meet with you, uh, the next phase is gonna start in February, so we're gonna be meeting uh, intensely with your staff, especially this spring. We're gonna take the summer to, uh, to finish this next phase of design, and then next fall, when you come back to school, we're gonna have a heck of a presentation to show you exactly what it's gonna look like. So with that, um, I'm gonna have Scott come up and he's gonna show you the fun stuff. Thanks, Chris. We're also going to have a few people walk around and do our first collection of cards. Uh, we'll make a few passes tonight, but if you're ready to turn in your questions, we'll start collecting those now so we're ready to answer them uh, when we get to that point. So what you're seeing up there in this image is what you're seeing down here up front. It's our study model. And we, we, let, off, we let off this... Uh, this meeting night with lots of people gathering around that model, and that's exactly what it's for. So one, a study model like this helps us internally as a design team understand the site, understand the building volumes, the building massing, how it's, relate, how it's relating to this site, the site topography. If any of you are familiar, which I'm sure most of you are, of the Bullock Newberry site, um, it's just hills on hills on hills. So um, we have, that was a design challenge that we were faced with, and our building is responding to that existing topography as much as it can. So that's one example of how, uh, a how we're solving a design problem, and we use a model like this to help us understand that better. And then the model, the second thing with the model is we can use it to convey our design to all of you. And that's what we were doing up here at the beginning of the meeting. If you didn't have a chance to come up here at the beginning, please come up after, walk around the model. I'll be up here. I can walk you through it. But so what we're going to do, and one, one uh, disclaimer here, it is a study model. So it, you know, we're going to show some, so, some images of it. When you see it up here, it's not museum quality, um, but, it, but it, it, it serves its purpose. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm excited to walk through some highlights of our design. Uh, this is a photograph of the 13th Street e entry. Uh, you can, again, see that in the model here. So this is the main entry that's going to face the community on 13th Street. This is, again, our model. We're studying volume. We're studying how that, we're studying how the plaza space uh, will feel like and trying to understand that a little bit better through the model. And then this is a conceptual rendering of what we see in our head when we're looking at this, at this model. So this is the entry off of 13th Street that will welcome students during the school day and invite visitors in uh, after hours and in evenings into the main public heart of the building um, that gives them access to the gymnasiums and other public, public parts of the, of, of the building. If we flip to the other side, we have the, the west entrance uh, which is directly on the other side of the building from that 13th Street entrance. Again, in our study model, we're looking at volumes, that entry plaza out front, how it relates to the parking and the site. Uh, and in our minds, we're picturing something like this. So again, an entry that's welcoming students, inviting visitors in, and again, those vi you're entering into that same public space, so it's really one continuous entry condition from 13th Street all the way through the building to the west side. The academic spaces. So Chris touched on the fact that we've condensed the building footprint and come up with a three-story academic scheme. That is this area in the center. So that's that three-story portion of the building. 
And the exciting, what that allows us to do is this program stacks on top of each other and allows us to open up volumes in the building. Um, this is an example of the high school at the academic wing, the 10 through 12 wing, where you have academic programs surrounding a two-story collaborative learning space. So again, that three-story scheme opens up lots of opportunities to add some volume in these spaces and really create special spaces inside of the building. Next, we're gonna focus on the auditorium. This, and you'll see it live up here in the model. This here, what I'm circling, is the auditorium. This is the fire station for context. Portage Trail is here. So the auditorium is anchoring the building on the Portage Trail site. So not only are you seeing the auditorium as you drive by on Portage Trail, as you enter the site at this existing light here by the fire station, that's your approach is focused on the lobby of this audit, of the auditorium that's directly accessed from the parking spaces, from the parking lot. And we're looking at, okay, so we have an auditorium with a balcony. How do we, what does the volume of our lobby look like? So this is a cross section. You can see the auditorium and the balcony on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see our two-story um, auditorium space or our two-story lobby space for the auditorium. And then this is, a, uh, again, a conceptual rendering of what we're starting to envision the inside of that lobby to be. This is what will be welcoming the community to, to the new auditorium. The last piece we're gonna highlight is the stadium. This is probably the best example of the fact that it's a study model. You see some foam core sticking out and uh, it's you know sloppy cuts and stuff, but, but that's, that's the beauty of it. We can transform this thing and work with it as we go along. Uh, but this view, what we're picturing in our head, is something like this. So, and this is a good example of already things that we're refining in our design. Those arched roofs and really high volume in the center of the space, that's no longer there. If we flip back to the other model, you can see we haven't even modeled that. That, uh, those, that's now a low slope roof that volume's been brought down that saved a lot of costs. So that, those are examples of the things that we've been doing to continue to refine our design. But the, the stadium seating, we're taking advantage of the existing Newberry Hill to kind of build that into the hill. So that's an exciting aspect that's still there. The, uh, this is a plaza area. Through these doors right here is the student dining space. So that plaza area can be used as exterior student dining, exterior learning, and at a football game or at a soccer uh, event, it's extra space, it's extra spectator space, it's spaces where you can sit down and have concessions. So it's, there's some really exciting things about this design um, and we're continuing to pursue them and refine them as we go along, but we wanted to share at least a sneak peek, like Chris said, of, of, what, we're, of what we're anticipating. And that was it. So I think we have our first round of cards that we'll start going through. We'll make another round. I'm sure there's, even after I'm showing these images, there's probably more questions that are popping up and, and we'll, uh, we'll get started answering some questions so we can answer as much as we can. Thanks, Scott. Um, I really couldn't read this. My glasses were fogging up over there. So I'm going to kind of do this on the fly. So bear with me. Um, will there be a dedicated wrestling room like we have now? Will it be larger than the existing one? It's a great question. Um, right now, we've got four dedicated PE spaces. We think that three of those are going to be gymnasiums, and the other is probably going to be weight room and wrestling room. So we're still in the design uh, for that part, and that's kind of we'll show you kind of what that looks like after we've talked to the district's PE coaches, um, athletic director, everybody, community, um, as we get through, and then you'll see what that looks like this coming fall. Are accommodations being made for additional drainage due, due to increased non-permeable surfaces? Yes. So I'm not sure if our site plan shows it or not. Yeah, so see what we've got outlined here, here, and here? Those are actually storm retention basins. So our code with new building and green building, um, we're not allowed to put any storm water off, off our site. It's all going to be contained and dealt with on our site. And we actually, there's a multiplier. So actually it accommodates way more than it, than it ever would in say a hundred year flood. So, um, so yes. 
And actually, this turf football field is going to have drainage all the way underneath it. And because we're a green school um, and we're following the green design principles, we're also going to have some non-permeable surface or some permeable surfaces in our parking lot. So it won't be just asphalt. Good question. And, and just to add to that quickly, the storm, the, the tension basins are dry basins. So they'll never, they'll only yeah, drain water good point. in the event of a storm. Most of the time they'll be completely dry. So the next one is we live on 13th directly across from Newberry and it's a nightmare trying to get on or off the driveway at certain times. I imagine it, dismissal and stuff from Bullock or any event that happens at Laybourne. Um, will there be a more efficient traffic flow to ease the congestion? So yes, and you, you can really see this on the model because we've scaled a bus and a car so you can see the scale of these driveways. But the whole key to alleviating congestion on the neighboring streets is to pull the traffic off the streets. So as you see, this long driveway right here um, is, runs parallel to 13th. So, and the same with all of this drive space are all places for cars and buses to line up in multiple lanes um, so that we handle our traffic on our site. We don't spill out onto 13th. I would, I would say it's, I mean, I, I grew up here. So, I, I mean, I know, <laughs> know what it looks like out there. So it'll be a remarkable improvement to, to the way it is now. Are the softball fields and baseball fields being relocated? No, they are not. They're staying where they are. As you can see, our site is pretty well taken up with just everything here. So we, quite frankly, just don't have room for softball or baseball on our, on our site. Probably the most important question yet. Will there be a snack bar at the football stadium? <laughs> yes. <laughs> The kids that go to Bullock, where would they go? So I'm glad we have the site plan up. The, the entire footprint of Bullock fits right here on this parking lot. So the kids are going to stay in Bullock while we build the school. Then they're going to move over to the new school. And then we're going to demolish Bullock and finish that parking lot. You can really see that on this model. Yes, and that's a, that's a change, right? Because that, that wasn't the design before when we were elongated, when we were that two-story option that went all the way from Porter's Trail to Newberry Hill. So this is another, it's a better design, quite frankly. So you'll be able to see this up here. Uh, we've got a model of Bullock, too, that you can put on the site and take a look at it. Oh, uh, let's see. What are the future plans for the current high school building? We don't know that. Um, I'm not sure anybody does right now, but I think as soon as they know, as soon as the district knows, you'll know. Uh, another question about flooding. I think we addressed that. Breaking ground was planned for 2022. Will that happen? Time is a priority. Unfortunately, it will not. So we're talking about an early site package happening. Oh, okay. Yes, it will. <laughs> um, so it looks like our early site will, will still happen in 2022. It's just you're not going to see a building rising up in 2022. But we understand that it's a, uh, that it will always be expensive to build the longer we wait. So we want to take advantage of that and build as soon as we can. Additional income sources. Can the city government of Cuyahoga Falls make a, make a, a greater contribution? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the city of Cuyahoga Falls is, isn't, um, they're not a funding partner here. But I think that uh, we're always open to donations. Uh, but quite honestly, no, they, they've got a huge investment in helping us with the plan review documents and the zoning permits and the planning permits, and they're a wonderful partner. Um, it's not their responsibility to fund the schools, quite frankly, just like the school district isn't responsible for funding the fire department. So with current construction supply shortages and delays and inflation, how will that impact construction timeline? It, it shouldn't. Um, and by that, I mean, you don't get halfway through to construction and realize that prices went up and now we have to stop. The beauty of this construction model that we talked about a while ago is it's construction manager at risk. The at risk part means that Hammond Construction is actually going to issue a guaranteed maximum price before you go to bid. So they might bid some stuff out first to get a good handle on that to reduce their risk, uh, which is totally fine. Um, but that saves the district from getting in trouble, from, from, from prices going up, and that's their risk. That's the part of the project that is. So that's, thankfully, you're uh, protected from that. Uh, 
Uh, if the money isn't available in a year after beginning the main building, state funded, what would the plan be for the auditorium and stadium? I think that's, I think I can interpret that as being, if the money isn't available for, um, like if we bid this out and the project is, is extremely high and you can't do the stadium or the auditorium at this time because we bid those separately and we have to build the co-funded portion, I believe, and, and if I misspeak, misspeak, Mr. Gomez, please correct me, but the, the district is, is committed to doing the final project in its completion has a stadium there and an auditorium there. Is that fair to say? So why aren't we building the track and field on the Newberry site first to ensure the sports can use labor and always have a home that's a great question, and we really looked at that hard. Um, we know um, how hard it's going to be to go a couple seasons without a soccer field and a track, quite frankly. Um, we just don't think we can accomplish that and have that operating. As you saw from that diagram especially, you can see how, how integral, and I think this is the beauty of this stadium, quite frankly, is taking advantage, advantage of the natural topography. See how integrated this is with the building? it would be awfully hard to have this built and while we're still building all this, keep that operational, being able to hold events there. It's just, we just don't think we can do that safely. Um, how much of Newberry Park will remain park and trees? We will, be, we will be invading Newberry Park a little bit. We are trying to stay out of it 100%, but because of the stormwater requirements, we're gonna have to do something there. Um, as we get closer to construction, we'll actually go out and tag the trees that will have to come down, and you'll be able to walk on the site and see which ones have ribbons around them that will, cut, that will come down. But we're making every single effort to save as many trees as we can in Newberry Park. Um, what per square foot cost do you estimate now? That's a tough question, um, because what does the square foot cost represent? Is it the subcontract, and I'll get a little wordy here, but is it subcontractor hard costs? Is it guaranteed maximum price? Does it include the construction contingency? Does it include design contingency? It's all over the place. So um, whoever asked that, maybe come up afterwards and maybe we can get a little bit more information to you. Does the annual operating budget allow for increased costs due to leasing equipment or will that mean staff cuts? No, I don't. I, I can speak for the district and then it won't mean staff cuts at the risk of doing that. It's actually, um, it, it actually is, is accounted for and your, your treasurer is awesome about this. She's very conservative. So she, she would never do something like lease furniture and then have to make staff cuts because of that. Education comes first. And another a repeat question about if the, uh, what happens if the money isn't available for LFIs when it's time to bid, which I think, think we answered. A couple more? Holy cow. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a repeat. What happens in the end if there's no money for the stadium and auditorium? Answer that. We are 20, 25% over budget with or without the auditorium and stadium. So we're not that at that point anymore. That was our initial estimate. We're currently about 10% over budget, and that's with the auditorium, with the stadium, with everything that you see right now. So we're, we're within striking distance. The problem is it's a big project. So 10% of $100 million is $10 million. So we're getting there. The good news with that is it's an awfully big building, right? So 365,000 square feet, if we save a half, if we save $1 a square foot, well, that's $365,000. So it works both ways. Um, so I hope I answered that one. So knowing there may be budget constraints on the initial plan for the auditorium and the planning committee requests to speak to our music educators, RE, regarding possible changes, can you share some of their feedback and concerns? Certainly can. Um, as you can imagine, our, our music and fine arts educators are extremely concerned about losing the auditorium. The good news is we're still maintaining these incredible music and art spaces that come with the, the core building. Their concerns, and very, very valid, is that it's hard to perform without that, without a stage and being in that setting. Um, 
And like I said, it's our belief, and it always has been, that that's a co-curricular educational space, not an extracurricular one. So we're disappointed that the state doesn't co-fund those spaces. Um, I think it was a mistake back in 1999 when they, co when they founded the OFCC, and to this day I'll tell them that. Um, but I think that's their concerns in a nutshell. I mean, it's very, very valid. So junior high school space versus high school space, question mark. Uh, they're going to fight every day in the cafe. No. Um, yeah, so I think that question is really alluding to, is there a clear division between, you know, our, our junior high school is middle school over here and high school over here. Um, and quite honestly, we're going to see how that, how that goes. We're, we're designing the building, and this is a key takeaway from today. We're designing the building as flexible, to be used as flexibly as possible. Educational design fails when it forces you to teach one way. That's why the open plan classrooms of the 70s failed, because it made you teach in the wide open space and there was no space to, to sit, to lecture, to, to do other kinds of educating, practical based learning, or you just disturb everybody else. Um, so this building will be as flexible as possible. Scott showed you two entrances. That those two entrances could very well be a high school and a middle school entrance, or it could be the east west entrance and the west entrance. So we're not there yet. We'll, we will have better answers for you at the uh, next fall. Okay, this one's not really a question. It's just a bunch. So greenhouse gardens, two maker spaces, tennis courts, solar panels, softball, baseball, lockers. Okay. I'm not sure how to... Uh, greenhouse? Yeah, I think we are planning for a greenhouse. Um, gardens, for sure. Maker spaces, absolutely. Tennis courts, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, we don't have tennis courts planned for this site currently. Solar panels, the building will be solar ready. What that means is that right now, so in Ohio, especially Northeast Ohio, it, it's, not, it's not economically feasible. In other words, they're not efficient enough to power a full school, but we, one day it will be. So what we do is we increase the structure on the roof. We, we provide conduit for wiring to go all the way down to the basement, or not the basement, the first floor electrical room, um, so that one day when you are able to put solar panels up there, it's all set and ready to go. And I think we talked about softball and baseball. Um, once again, a, a concern about the traffic flow on 13th, which I think we've addressed. Uh, stadium and auditorium again, I think we've addressed that. This is a current, Current discussion says the auditorium would cost about $8 million, but $9 million was included in the LFI. How are the costs decreasing for the auditorium, but increasing by 20, 25% for the rest of the building? So there's a difference between budget and estimate. So right now, we're actually estimating, we actually budgeted $10 million for the stadium and $10 million for the auditorium. Um, and a black box theater. I should make sure that that's in there too. So, um, so right now our auditorium is pr roughly estimated at $8.8 .8 million. The, the other million dollars is roughly that black box theater in the, in the connecting spaces. Um, and the stadium's actually less than that. So right now our stadium's I think six or $7 million. Uh, and that extra money is going into the co-funded portion of the building to offset that budget. So that's, that's how we're dealing with that. And that's the difference between a budget and an estimate. And once again, they're schematic design estimates. By the way, some of these are blank. I'm not throwing away <laughs> questions. Um, will the new school have metal detectors? 100% up to the administration. Right now, we're not currently planning for them. And another question about tennis courts, which we are not currently planning for. So there's a question about the academics. And it says, he mentioned that the academic center portion would house 10 to 12 grades. Is there a separate area for freshmen? Are they in another building? No, that was just a snapshot. So we've got kind of right now, we've got the divided up into um, sixth and seventh graders, eighth and ninth graders, and then 10 through 12 in their academic centers. And that was an example of what the high school academic center could look like. That's the collaborative space in between the, the, the classrooms. So they're all in the, in the building. What kind of technical facilities are being included? Example, computer labs, audiovisual labs. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, I often talk about 
our schools today are so technologically advanced and designed that some of the schools that we've designed have even foregone a media center because the entire school is a media center. So it's that rich with technology. We're not foregoing a media center. We're going to have a library in this building. Don't worry about that. But, it, but that's just an example of how many of those spaces. Um, and there will be technology labs and so on. So it's good. So how many band rooms, choir rooms, and general music practice spaces will be implemented in the current version of the building? Without getting into the actual number, number of spaces, if, you're, if you look at this, the big footprint of the building, this center portion is that academic portion I talked about. So 6th and 7th, 8th and 9th, 10th through 12th. See this whole building right here? That's all music and arts. So this is the auditorium, and then this whole space, over a third of the building, is uh, fine and professional arts. Will the high school be 9 through 12 or 10 through 12? I, I don't think there's a division quite that. I just kind of explained the academic spaces, um, and we're still refining that. So we'll get back, but I think that the grade grouping makes sense to our curricular leaders in the district. Where will the auto program be? Uh, the automotive program right now is staying at the high school. So we're not providing a new automotive space in this new building. It's not a co-fundable space by the state of Ohio. It, we didn't have enough students enrolled at the time of the master plan to get that co-funded. How much of Newberry uh, Woods will be saved? Once again, we'll get back to you on that. Is Calgo Falls Middle and High School projected to grow or shrink? That's a great question. Um, all, I shouldn't say all, most districts in the state of Ohio are shrinking, right? Um, they are shrinking at a less rapid pace now than they were 10 years ago, uh, but they're still declining enrollment in, in Ohio, specifically Northeast Ohio. Central Ohio is still holding steady, um, the Columbus area. Northeast Ohio has been steadily declining, just the lack of families and lack of kids that are enrolled as compared to baby boomers and Gen Xers and, and so on. And, and I think that holds true for Cuyahoga Falls. I think if you look at the history of en enrollment, it is steadily declining, but I think it's, it's kind of holding steady here over the last couple of years. It's hard to tell with the pandemic, right? With remote learning and, and getting enrollment counts. Um, is the refined plan more than sufficient for current and future students from here and neighboring areas? This will be it for many decades. And that's a, that's a good question too. So if our, build, our buildings are designed, there's a difference between capacity and then enrollment design, right? So design capacity means how many students are you designing the building for? What it means in actuality is that if we have, you know, we're not... If you just if you put 25 kids in every academic every teaching space in the school, meaning uh, core classrooms, so math, science, English, um, language arts, foreign languages, that kind of stuff. Uh, music is empty, art is empty, cafeterias are empty, special education is empty, the administration is empty, and all the gymnasiums are empty. That's the kind of capacity you're going to have in this new building. For the band and choir rooms, is the plan to keep elevated riser seating like the existing rooms? We haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, but we will. And it will be what you want. Uh, for the theater classrooms, will it be a small theater space like the current space or move to a black box theater space similar to Firestone High School? Um, I think the plans are now to, we, we haven't gotten into the guts of this, but the plan, the original intent was designed a black box theater. Uh, but there's some debate going on right now whether that wants to be similar to our little theater or if it wants to be a, um, a black box theater. And we'll have, we have those discussions with your music and drama department. How are we doing on time? I think we're good. So volume space won't be able to be used by students in reality. I'm not sure what that means. It's a two-story volume space that we showed in that image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So one, so once again, I think that the goal is to design flexible spaces, right? So there will be many kinds of spaces for kids to learn in and people to teach in and kids to do activities in. And I think that this example of this space is this is for a certain kind of activity, right? It's, it's for um, active learning or it's for researching or it's for sitting in, sitting in, a, in a cubby or we call it a cave and being able to type on a laptop and do and focus in, put headphones on and work or it's to sit in a small group and have a discussion over a project or something like that. That's what that space is intended for. Um, will the courtyard really be used by students when in other schools they are always closed for use? We hope so. Um, a courtyard serves multiple purposes though. It's a way for architecturally for us to get natural light into the classrooms too. And that's a very important thing. Every classroom space we have has to have natural light. Uh, coming into it. So it serves dual purposes, but we hope that we design it in such a way, and we're asked for your help on this, design it in such a way that it's actively used. Um, outdoor dining for students won't ever be allowed to be used as you were stating. Oh gosh, I hope not. Um, I, I think that's really a cool space to be able to go outside and have, have lunch and so on, but that's a policy thing, um, not really a design thing. Most concern on voter promises. Large auditorium is greater than what we have now. Uh, it's the field house, which was an afterthought. Is it still being considered? No. Um, there was some thought that we might be able to afford a, fi a field house out by the stadium. Uh, you're right. It was never considered in the planning, and it was one of the first things that, that uh, we cut. Is it true it is being considered to not build the promised auditorium? I think we discussed that. Um, should we scrap the black box theater? As of now, there's no plan. As I said, we're designing everything right now. We'll get pre and we're not planning on bidding that as an alternate. Right now, that's that's in. The only two things we're planning on bidding as an alternate is the stadium and the uh, auditorium. Do we really need lockers? They have not been used at all um, for some years, and boy, don't we know it. We've actually designed brand new high schools, and we've designed a brand new six through twelve building where. The lockers are, there's not a locker for every single student, but there's lockers of different sizes that they can use their student ID and punch in and use it for a day if they want to. So in that way, we can put less lockers in that takes up less wall space. It's less expensive uh, and it's more flexible. It's and quite honestly, it's what how students use the, the schools now. More questions? <laughs> can you reclassify the auditorium as classroom space? Because it is. I love it. I love it. I wish we could. How will the district fund the auditorium and stadium budgeted at 18 million in the, in the uh, bond information if there is not bond funding available? I think that's that uh, additional funding tool. So if we can't, if for some reason we can't afford to do it, um, then we're going to look for alternative ways to, to fund it. Once again, I'll stress that you protect that co-funded portion or else we don't, we don't have a new school. Please explain how design provides additional safety that is not currently present in our buildings. That's a great, great question. Um, our new buildings are set up, in this building there'll be pro probably 300 cameras. Um, it's a lot. Now cameras are, aren't necessarily deterrents, they're more kind of catch what happened after the fact. Uh, but just the fact of people, uh, visitors and students knowing that there are cameras everywhere, you're being monitored all the way through the building, um, is a deterrent. Our, we set up passive security measures so that when you enter the building, anybody enter the building gets buzzed into a lobby area that goes directly into the office and the door from the office to the rest of the building is locked at all times. So you have to be either physically taken into the building or escorted through. Uh, that's another way of passively designing. The other thing is to make sure that you've got clear sight lines through the corridors um, so that you can monitor at a quick glance of what's going on. Uh, and then the best security of all, and Cuyahoga Falls is one of the best at this, is treating this like your home. And you know when a stranger walks into your house. But we can, I can talk for an hour on that, I won't. So comment representing myself and three other parents who could not be here tonight. Will you and the school board commit to pursuing all options until they are completed? as soon as possible. Sure. Um, 
We voted for and invested, and are absolutely invested in the auditorium and the sports facilities. Yep, I get it. Losing or cutting corners in the auditorium is a non-negotiable. What is happening with this in mind? I think we've talked about that. Um, the original plan called for a field house that would accompany the stadium to fix the co-curricular needs of our student athletes. What happened to that? Um, it was, we just couldn't afford it. It was never in the planning phases. It was added after the fact, uh, hoping that we could afford it. We were gonna use the same bid strategy, not knowing that prices were gonna be 25% higher than they are. Um, but because it wasn't in the original bond, we made the decision that that, uh, that would go away. Now there's still space for it. Someday we can build it. A third of the space to the fine arts seem a lot, seems like a lot. They should consider make of that, making some of that tech heavy. I think I explained that you know, technology is gonna be riddled through the building, including the, the uh, performing arts spaces. So. so I think that's good. And I, I would politely disagree. I don't think a third of the building being dedicated to, uh, to the arts is excessive. Will there be any considerations made to alleviate the noise during construction? Hammond Construction is committed to not making a sound, a peep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, honestly, they do everything. Um, they're, they're one of the best construction managers out there. They do everything in their power uh, to limit, uh, limit noise, and they do that by limiting the time that contractors can do certain activities on site. So certain times of the day is they can't do things that make certain noises, um, and, and that's it's great. Unfortunately, it is construction. <laughs> Do you think Mr. Gomez could pull off red glasses? <laughs> Absolutely. If he's got the rainbow mask, he pulls that off, he could pull off red glasses. That's it. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. We're so excited and so thankful for you coming out. Uh, we'll be around. We'll be up here to answer questions if you'd like to come up. Um, but we can't thank you enough for your time tonight. We can't look, we can't wait to present what the final version is going to be coming up next fall. And we'll see you guys all in the meantime. So thank you so much.